Recording 1A. Speaker A. On Mondays at school, a group of us always talk about whatever movies we saw at the weekend. On Saturdays, I often get together with my classmates and we see all the latest releases together. I can't remember the last time I saw a film with my parents. We just don't have much in common anymore. Speaker B. My parents are both teachers, so you'd imagine I'd have no trouble at all academically. When I was little, it was great because we had a really great relationship. But nowadays, all we seem to do is argue, and that causes a lot of conflict between us, so I don't really feel I can go to them for help. My friends aren't much help either, as they've all got the same problem. Thank goodness I get on really well with my tutor at university. She's very approachable, and if I'm struggling with an assignment, I find her advice really helps me. Speaker C. My parents are quite old, so I feel as though they're out of touch with the modern world. They don't seem to have any idea of what things cost. I'm hoping to get a car in the next few months, but I'll be taking my older brother along to help. We used to fight a lot when we were growing up, but there's a really close bond between us now. He's already had a few cars, so I'm sure he'll be a great help. Speaker D. I play the violin and the piano, and my granddad is a great cello player. A lot of my friends at school listen to all the popular bands and singers, but my tastes are totally different. I prefer classical music, and they just don't understand it at all. Luckily, granddad shares my taste. So we often buy CDs and talk about them together. Recording 1B. Tell me about your family. Well, my immediate family is relatively small, just my parents, my two brothers, and me. But both of my parents come from very large families, so my extended family is very large. I have 25 cousins. Our family gatherings are pretty chaotic but fun. We're a very close knit family. Even though we don't live together anymore, the family ties are still very strong. When we were little, there wasn't very much sibling rivalry between us. I think it's because we had a very stable upbringing. Both of my parents played a very active role in our school life and our home life. And they taught us to resolve our conflicts in a very fair way. I consider myself very lucky. Who are you most similar to in your family? Well, you can see a very clear family resemblance between my brothers and me. But everyone tells me that the physical resemblance between me and my maternal grandmother is very striking. Sadly, I never got to meet her because she died before I was born. But I've seen photographs of her at my age, and we're quite alike. Other than that, I think I have my father's temperament. We're both very stubborn. But thankfully, I also inherited his mathematical brain. And what do you think it takes to be a good parent? Well, I don't think just anyone can be a good parent. Not everyone has the right instincts. I think I have a very strong maternal instinct because I love taking care of small children. So I hope to become a mother one day. I think it takes a great deal of patience and love. Recording 1C. You will hear the director of a childcare centre talking to the parent of a new child. Good morning. My name is Bob Ferguson, and I'm the director of Ascot Childcare Centre. Oh, good morning. I'm Sally Ann Cullen. I made an appointment to enrol my daughter. That's right. I've got the application form right here. Now, first, I need some personal details. So the family name is Cullen. Is that right? That's right. Now, what about your daughter? What does she like to be called? Oh, her name is Alexandra, but we all just call her Alex. A L E X. Great. As you know, we organise the children into different age groups. There's the babies group, the toddlers, aged two to three, and the preschoolers. They're aged four to five. How old is your daughter? Well, she'd go into the toddler group. She's just turned three. 
And we always like to make a note of our children's birthdays so we can celebrate it all together if they're at the centre on that day. When was she born? Oh, um, the 8th of November. Fine. And we also find it's a great help to know about siblings. Sometimes a problem at the centre can be related to problems with a sibling. Does she have any brothers or sisters? Yes, a brother, Fraser. He's two years older. So that would make him five, is that right? Yes, that's right. Fine. Now, we also need a contact address. Where do you live? It's 108 Park Road. That's P-A-R-K, Maidstone. Good. Now, last of all, we need a telephone number we can call if there are any problems. Oh, well, I'll be at work and so will my husband, so the best number to call is 3467 double eight nine oh right and is that a close relative yes it's my mother-in-law's number we prefer to make a note of how the person is related to the child so i'll write down grandmother yes that does make more sense now that's all of the personal details we also like to try and get a picture of your child's personal development can you tell me if there are any specific problems she's having for example does she get on well with other children is sleeping a problem Oh, she gets on well with others, I think, but she does have trouble sleeping. We gave up her daytime nap a long time ago. That's good to know. I'll make a note of that. She can just have some quiet time while the others are resting, if she likes. <laughs> that should be fine. She enjoys drawing quietly. Right. Now, what about other skills? We occasionally take the children swimming, fully supervised, of course, and we only go in a paddling pool as we don't expect them to swim by themselves yet. Does your daughter need a lot of help getting changed? Uh, no, not at all. In fact, she's been able to get dressed in the mornings for over a year, over a year now, so no problems there. That must be a big help for you. Now, what about the childcare arrangements? Are there any specific days you require? Well, I work Monday to Wednesday, but my mother-in-law has agreed to look after her on Wednesdays. So does that mean that you'll just need Monday and Tuesday for now? That's right. And what about the pick-up time? We offer extended hours for parents who work a great distance away. Hmm. I work until three o'clock, but it takes me about half an hour to drive home, so ideally I'd like to pick her up at four, if that's OK. That would be fine. Now, is there any other information you'd like to... Recording 2A In the first years of a child's life, many important milestones are reached. By the end of the first year, a baby will have already acquired some social skills. He will enjoy imitating people and will also test parental responses to his behaviour. Uh, for example, what do my parents do if I refuse food? In terms of movement, an infant will be able to reach a sitting position unassisted and pull himself up to stand. He may be able to walk momentarily without support. As far as communication is concerned, he'll be able to use simple gestures, such as shaking his head for no, say mama and dada, and he will try to imitate words. When it comes to cognitive development, he'll be able to find hidden objects easily and use objects correctly, such as drinking from a cup. By the age of two or three, the infant has reached the toddler stage. In terms of social skills, this means he's becoming more independent, which may result in the occasional tantrum. However, he has learned to take turns in games and spontaneously expresses affection. His physical development will also have increased significantly, as he can now move around a lot faster and even run. He can also climb upstairs or onto relatively low obstacles, and even ride a small tricycle. However, he will still be rather unsteady on his feet at times. When it comes to language and communication, he can now understand most sentences and uses four- and five-word sentences. In terms of cognitive development, he's learnt to play make-believe games and uses his imagination more. He has also mastered the skill of sorting objects according to their shape and colour. Between the ages of six and twelve, a child reaches what is termed middle childhood, and they will stay in this phase until they reach adolescence. In middle childhood, children's development is more affected by the outside world, and the child's world expands to include friends, teachers, sports trainers, and so on. 
Children develop at various rates, and while some children in middle childhood seem very mature in terms of their emotional and social skills, others seem very immature. As far as physical milestones are concerned, during this stage growth is steady but less rapid than during the preschool years. There are some major changes occurring at this stage, as baby teeth will come out and permanent adult teeth will grow. As the mouth is not yet fully developed, this may cause overcrowding. Eyes will reach maturity in both size and function. In terms of their cognitive ability, children at this stage master the skills of sequencing and ordering, which are essential for maths. By the end of this period, children should have acquired effective reading and writing skills. Recording 2B. What do you remember about your early childhood? Oh, I remember being very happy. I have a lot of great memories of my childhood. In fact, my sisters and I often reminisce about it. Perhaps when you look back, everything seems better. But our summer holidays seem to go on forever, and the sun always seems to be shining. Nowadays, if we ever have a hot summer day, it always reminds me of my childhood holidays. Do you think you have a good memory or a poor memory? Well, when I was younger, I think I used to have a very good memory. I used to be able to memorize long lists of dates without any trouble. But I find it harder and harder to remember things these days, so now I'd say my memory is quite poor. When I'm studying, I find I have to think up strategies to help me, like visualizing something associated with a particular word. I even forget important things sometimes, so I have to write myself little notes as a reminder. Recording three A. Part one. The heart is considered to be a muscle, and just like any other muscle in your body, your diet has a direct impact on the way that it works. The food you eat every day can affect the way that blood flows through your heart and arteries. A diet that is high in fat can gradually cause a build-up in your arteries that slows down the blood flow and can even block small arteries. If an artery that carries blood to the heart becomes blocked, the heart muscle can die. This is known as a heart attack, and sufferers must receive treatment quickly. If the blockage occurs in an artery that carries blood to the brain, part of the brain can die. This is known as a stroke. The effects of a stroke can be debilitating, and there is no known cure. The correct diet can help you control your weight and keep your arteries clear, thereby reducing the risk of heart problems and stroke. Recording three B, part two. So, what can you do to lose weight? Well, exercise is by far the best way. Burning calories and working off the fat will help you look and feel better. Regular exercise helps you burn calories faster. Even when you're sitting still, but what is the best type of exercise for your heart? Well, studies have shown that aerobic exercise causes you to breathe more deeply and makes your heart work harder to pump blood. Aerobic exercise also raises your heart rate and thus burns calories. Common examples of aerobic exercise include walking briskly, jogging, running, swimming, and cycling. People are often unsure just how much exercise they need. Again, recent studies can help. These have shown that it's best to begin slowly and gradually work up to 30 minutes of exercise four to six times a week. However, your doctor may make a different recommendation based on your health. For example, it may be best to start with only a couple of minutes of exercise or begin at a fairly slow pace. If you're not used to exercise, be sure to pay careful attention to your body. One sure sign that you may be overdoing it is if you can't carry on a conversation while you exercise. To give your body the chance to recover, it's also best to alternate exercise days with rest days. Recording three C.
bath, bathe, birth, breath, breathe, death, growth, health, mouth, mouth, teeth, teeth, writhe. Recording 3D. 1. I took a deep breath before diving into the water. 2. The baby's crying because he's teething. He got two new teeth only yesterday. 3. Old people should take care of their health. 4. He's been so happy since the birth of his son. 5. The pain was so bad she was writhing in agony. 6. He can't breathe. You need to get him to hospital. Recording 4A Do you think people work too much nowadays? Not really. I think people have always worked hard for a living. I mean, it's never been easy for anyone, has it? You have to work hard if you want to achieve anything in your life. That's just the way it is, and there isn't a lot you can do about it. Life has its ups and downs, and I think the best thing to do is accept that and get on with it. What do you like to do to relax? For me, there is only one way to relax, and that's through sports. I like to live life on the edge, so I do a lot of extreme sports, like paragliding and deep-sea diving. When you're in a dangerous situation, that's when you really feel alive. I think your attitude has a big impact on your quality of life. What's your idea of a perfect day? I don't think there's any such thing as the perfect day. Something always seems to happen to spoil it. Some people say I have a negative attitude, but if I plan a picnic with friends, then either it rains or my friends decide not to come along. I think it's a waste of time making plans like that. Life can be full of disappointments. How would you describe your attitude to life? I have a very positive outlook on life. I think it's important to treat every day as special and live life to the full. Some people approach everything as if their glass is half empty. If you do that, then it will colour every experience you have. I think if you want to lead a happy life, then you need to have a positive approach to everything. Recording 4B You will hear a woman talking on the radio about things for children to do during the school holidays. The school holidays are fast approaching and I'm sure all of you parents out there are worried about how to occupy your children. Well, I have a few tips that may help keep your children entertained without spending large amounts of money. One of our biggest problems is that today's children often do not have the type of hobby that was familiar in the past, such as making their own toys. Instead, they rely on sophisticated video games to keep them amused. But children also like to feel needed, so why not give them jobs to do around the house? You may be surprised how much they will enjoy simple tasks such as washing your car. Another idea is to use this time to develop their cooking skills. Food is something we all enjoy, so why not get them to prepare some simple dishes in the kitchen? Learning to cook is a useful life skill for children to learn, and it can also keep them happy for several hours. Children also love doing arts and crafts, so why not give them the task of making presents for upcoming birthdays or celebrations? Not only will they enjoy making them, but you'll also save some money, and the family or friends who receive the gifts are sure to be delighted. A great idea to get children out of the house is to find out about how they can help in your local community. Perhaps there is a home for the elderly nearby. They are sure to welcome a visit from young people. Even a few minutes a week can brighten their day. 
Of course, younger children cannot do these things for very long, but older ones may find that there are ongoing projects around your neighbourhood that they can help with. These are just a few ideas, but I'm sure you can think of many more. If not, there are plenty of places to look for other suggestions. Nowadays, the first place people seem to look is the internet, which can be a good source of information. However, it does have its limits because ideas suitable for children living in the city may not translate well for children in rural areas. So, don't overlook your library. These are often filled with great ideas targeted at children in your specific area. There are a few key points to remember, however. One of the most important things is to keep your children active; otherwise, they will be sure to get bored. Also, remember that although children can be very independent, even from nine or ten years old, you should still be there to take care of them up to the age of twelve. So, don't be tempted to let older children babysit their younger siblings. This should only be done by an adult. Recording five A. Can you tell me about your early education? Well, I went to kindergarten from the age of four, and I remember that I didn't enjoy it very much at all. Primary school was a little better, especially because my mum was a teacher in a school. She taught in the junior part of the school, and she was actually my teacher in first grade. But when I went up to the senior school, I didn't see very much of her. After that, I was lucky enough to receive a scholarship to go to a very good high school. My parents couldn't have afforded to send me to a private school, so it was a really great opportunity for me. It was a single-sex school, so there were no boys. I'm glad I didn't go to a mixed school because I think there are fewer distractions, so everyone can just concentrate on their studies. Recording five B. So you have graduated from university and decided to continue studying towards a master's or PhD. At some stage during the next few years, you will need to consider your thesis. One of the greatest difficulties faced by postgraduate students is choosing a topic to base their dissertation on. Writing a thesis can be very daunting. But the task is much more straightforward if the topic you select is appropriate for you. So, what can you do to solve this problem? Well, there are several things to keep in mind. Firstly, you need to do your research so that you are very familiar with all the current literature. On top of this, you also need to be sure that you have a broad knowledge of your area of specialization. If you do this, it will help you with the next important point in choosing a good subject for your research. Which is to ascertain what is relevant in your research area. This will be crucial in helping you to narrow your choices down. From the very beginning, it really is vital to set clear limits and to have a very fixed plan in terms of the scope of your research. It can be even more helpful to analyse existing research and ask yourself if there are any controversies. Perhaps there is a theory that you may want to challenge, and this could be the focus of your study. A further and very important factor to take into account is your own financial resources. If these are limited, then you need to avoid choosing a study that will involve costly equipment or surveys. However, if this is the case, you needn't despair or abandon your ideas altogether. Instead, make inquiries into funding from external agencies such as your local government. You may even find that local industries are willing to support your research by providing a grant. It's always worth looking around to see just what is possible, and finally, be sure to make good use of your tutor, especially when it comes to making sure that your findings are accurate. Recording five C. Academic. Assignment. Consideration. Concentrate. Controversy. Controversy. Conduct. Distraction. Dissertation. Economist. Educational. Educated.
research, thesis, theory, theoretical. Recording six A. I'm a French teacher, but I remember when I first started to learn the language, I really struggled with it. I didn't really have a problem with the pronunciation, like the other kids in my class. I was just overwhelmed by all of the vocabulary. But I persevered, and soon I was scoring ten out of ten in all of the tests. By the time I got to university, I could produce essays and translate eighteenth-century texts without much difficulty, and I actually enjoyed learning the grammar rules. Then, as part of my university course, I had to go and live in France for a year. That's when I learned that communication was more important than accuracy. As soon as I arrived, I realized I didn't know how to order the type of coffee I liked, and trying to find accommodation was a nightmare. I called people about ads in the paper, but I had to keep putting the phone down because I couldn't understand a word they were saying. They all spoke so quickly. There was a very real language barrier. I could see then that there's no point in just knowing words if you can't hold a conversation with a native speaker. Fluency is what helps you to function properly. It's what helps you get a job, hold a conversation, or just buy the things you need. Recording six B. What do you think you need to do to be a good language learner? Well, you need to be able to put down your textbooks from time to time and forget about accuracy. That's the only way to become more fluent in a language. You also need to speak to native speakers of the language as much as you can. What do you think makes a good language teacher? I think the best language teachers are those who can speak another language themselves. Teachers also need to be able to explain things clearly and in a way that is easy to follow. What problems do people experience when learning your language? My first language is very difficult to learn because of the pronunciation. The individual sounds are very strange to other nationalities, and often difficult for them to pronounce. Recording seven A, speaker one. I live in a quaint little village about three hundred kilometers from the nearest big city. Although it's a long way, the drive from the city is well worth the effort because the surrounding countryside is very scenic. I like living here because it's so peaceful and the air is really fresh, so it's much nicer than in the city. It's a pretty sleepy village, but on Sundays there's a huge market, and people come from all the neighbouring villages to buy and sell their local produce. Speaker two. The most popular part of my hometown is the beach. We have long stretches of white sand, and the water is crystal clear. The sea can be very calm at times, but the surf can also be spectacular. Visitors who enjoy water sports are really well catered for, as you can go snorkeling, scuba diving, and deep sea fishing. Soon we're going to get our own airport, but for now people can only get here by ferry. Speaker three. My city is famous for its skyscrapers, statues, and fountains, but most of all for its shopping. You can buy anything you want here, and we have over fifty large shopping malls. We get a lot of overseas visitors, so our airport is one of the busiest in the world. It's a very exciting and cosmopolitan place to live. Most people don't drive because there are always traffic jams, but the public transport is really well organized. We have some great attractions nearby for visitors, as well as a huge sports stadium and fantastic theme parks. I suppose the only downside is that the air can get a little polluted at times. Speaker four. My village is two hundred meters above sea level, and we overlook the villages and lakes down in the valley below. It's very picturesque up here, so we get a lot of visitors. 
especially artists who want to paint the landscape. They also like our traditional houses. The air is very crisp up here as well, so a lot of people come up here to escape the heat in the city. The roads are pretty treacherous because they're very steep and winding, so most people arrive by train. The scenery on the way up here really is breathtaking. Recording 7B Boundary Bought Cough Country Course Double Doubt Drought Enough Journal Journey Nought Rough South Southern Tourism Tourist Trouble Trough Recording 8A Speaker 1 I must say I'm never on time in fact, I was late for meetings three days in a row last week. Everyone's always angry with me, because I do tend to keep people waiting a lot. Work is my problem. I get so engrossed that I lose all track of time. I try to get everything else ready before I start, which saves a bit of time, but before I know it, a few hours have passed and I'm already late. Speaker 2 I can't say I'm very punctual. I do my best not to be late because I hate being kept waiting myself, but I do sometimes spend too much time getting ready. If I'm going out somewhere, I like to plait my hair, which is very thick, so this can be very time-consuming, and I often have to rush through everything else I need to do. I once went to a wedding, and I took so long doing my hair that I only just arrived in time to hear the bride say, I do. Speaker 3 I could tell the time at a very early age, and I've been obsessed with punctuality ever since. I own about 12 watches and clocks, but none of them show the right time. I can't stand to be late for work or in a hurry, so I make sure they're all ten minutes fast. And I always carry a spare watch in case one of them stops. That way, I always arrive at meetings in plenty of time and I can take my time getting my paperwork ready. Recording 8B Welcome once again to Introduction to Dentistry. And in today's lecture, we'll be looking at the history of dentistry through the ages. Now, skulls of the Cro-Magnon people who inhabited the Earth 25,000 years ago show evidence of tooth decay, and the earliest recorded mention of oral disease was in 5000 BC. This proves that oral disease is by no means a modern-day problem and has in fact plagued humans since time began. That particular reference appeared in a text written by the ancient people of Sumeria, which referred to tooth worms. There is also evidence that dental problems cause difficulties in other early civilizations, and people from those times actually developed treatments for them. For example, we have found historical evidence that the Chinese used acupuncture to treat the pain associated with tooth decay. There is even further evidence of the troubles caused by toothache in the Ebers Papyrus, which is a text written between 1700 and 1500 BC by the people of ancient Egypt. This papyrus contains references to diseases of the teeth, as well as prescriptions for medications they used at that time. While today we automatically prescribe antibiotics, the ancient Egyptians relied on more traditional remedies to help with tooth decay. Firstly, olive oil, which even today is known to have therapeutic qualities. And secondly, onions, which again are an age-old traditional medicine, and are still recognised as a reliable source of natural antibiotics. A large proportion of early dentistry was practised as a part of general medicine. However, by the 5th century BC, Herodotus, a Greek historian, made the following observation. In Egypt, medicine is practised on... 
based on a plan of separation. Each physician treats a single disorder and no more. Some undertake to cure diseases of the eye, others the head, and others again of the teeth. The Greeks were at the forefront of dentistry of that time, and it was a Greek physician who lived between 1300 and 1200 BC who chose to extract problem teeth long before anyone else. Arabs were also pioneers in the area of oral hygiene, and used a small polishing stick as a toothbrush as early as 100 BC. So, what of Europe? Well, throughout the Middle Ages, dentistry was made available to the wealthier classes thanks to physicians who would visit individuals in their home, while dentistry for the poorer people took place in the marketplace. Italian sources from the 1400s mentioned the use of gold leaf as dental filling material. But it was a Frenchman, Pierre Fouchard, who is credited with being the father of modern dentistry, thanks to his book *The Surgeon Dentist: A Treatise on Teeth*, which describes basic oral anatomy and the signs and symptoms of tooth decay. Recording nine A. The meerkat is found exclusively on the semi-arid plains of southern Africa. In terms of its natural environment. The meerkat avoids woodland and dense vegetation. At night, the meerkat retires to a network of burrows, which it digs with its powerful forelegs. If rocky ground makes this impossible, the meerkat will make its den in the crevices between the rocks. Meerkats feed mainly on insects, spiders, and snails, but their diet occasionally includes small rodents, lizards. And the roots of certain plants. They will even tackle dangerous prey such as scorpions and snakes. Relying on its keen sense of smell, the meerkat is a successful forager. Recording nine B. Adapt. Agriculture. Catastrophe. Chemical. Climate. Disastrous, endangered, genetically, human, natural, vulnerable. Recording ten A. Many people believe that one day we will form a colony on another planet. Today, we're going to look at some other planets and consider why it will never be feasible for humans to live on them. Let's start with Venus. Now, Venus is unusual because it rotates in a different direction to the other planets orbiting the sun. In terms of its physical features, it's similar in size to Earth. However, unlike Earth, it doesn't have any oceans. It's also extremely hot, thanks to the thick covering of cloud, which keeps the heat at 484 degrees centigrade. This cloud also reflects sunlight, which is why Venus appears so bright from Earth. A further problem is the continual thunderstorms, which could make life there rather unpleasant. The surface of Venus also has many craters as a result of asteroid collisions. Next is Mercury, which is a third of the size of our planet. In fact, it's smaller than all the other planets except Pluto. Life would be difficult there because it's close to the sun and has almost no atmosphere. On Mercury, the temperature varies more than on any other planet in the solar system, and as it has no water, it is unable to sustain life. Let's consider Saturn next. We know a lot more about Saturn nowadays, thanks to the Voyager space shuttle, which taught us a lot about the rings around Saturn. We also know that Saturn has a large number of moons. Saturn has barely any solid surface, as its composition is mostly gas. It's also extremely hot, making life for humans impossible. Recording ten B. Astronaut, atmosphere, commercial, explorer, exploration, galaxy, horizon, 
horizontal, outer, satellite, solar system, sustain, universal. Recording 10C. You will hear two science lecturers discussing space exploration. Hello, John. How was your conference on space travel? Hi, Susan. It was great. We heard some fascinating speakers, especially one fellow who was an expert on Mars.、Mm. He thinks it's quite feasible for humans to live there in the near future. Well, if we spent the billions of dollars that go into space research on looking after our own planet, then perhaps we wouldn't need to worry about the Earth being uninhabitable in a hundred years' time. Nor would we need to look for another planet to colonize. Yes, but there are some important things that space exploration can teach us, you know, especially about the history of our own planet and its atmosphere. That sort of knowledge could help us solve some of the problems that threaten our planet. Still, I don't really see why they have to send astronauts into space. Robotics is so much more advanced now. Why can't they simply send robots? Well, robotics has come a long way, and it is more expensive to send a manned spaceship into orbit. But the biggest problem with robots is that they have to be programmed for every possible eventuality. Yes, I suppose you're right. Robots just can't react to situations independently the way that humans do. They still need us to tell them what to do. That's right. Robots may have come a long way, but if you're going to go to all the expense of building one, you really need to make sure it's going to work when it gets there. And they don't tend to take risks with new and untested technology. What if it lets you down? So instead, a lot of the space technology nowadays is actually based on the technology they used in the 1970s, because we know that it works and it's reliable. So, do you think it will ever be possible to send robots to Mars? I'm not sure. One of the speakers spoke about that, and he says that communication would be a problem. Is that because of the conditions? I mean, those extremes of temperature and even the atmosphere itself would probably create an awful lot of interference. Yes, but they're both issues that can be dealt with. Now, the real problem is simply how far away it is. That would cause long delays before the robots received any messages about what to do next. So, for the moment, they don't think it's feasible.、Hmm, that makes sense. But tell me, do you really think we should be contemplating sending humans to Mars at all? Don't you think we should wait until we do have the technology? Well, many years ago, the civilizations that built the pyramids or that began building enormous cathedrals must have started the project, never expecting to see it finished. I think we should take the same approach and start our preparations now. That's an interesting point, though I'm still not convinced. Surely you don't foresee a time when humans will be living on Mars. That's just science fiction, isn't it? Not at all. I think there is a distinct possibility that humans will live there. But what about the conditions there? Even the dirt on the ground could kill us. Yes, I agree with you there. But we can easily build a self-contained structure there, so people don't need to go outside. Hmm. I suppose the ground does also contain a lot of resources, so getting metals wouldn't be a problem. That's right. A lot of building materials could be found there, but there are still many risks involved. Yes. What about radiation? I don't think there will ever be a way to shield us totally from cosmic radiation, even inside a spaceship. I can't agree with you there. Astronauts have been travelling in space for a long time now, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem for us. I just don't think we have enough experience of living in space long term. But you have to accept that it is within the realms of possibility that one day there will be a Martian space station. Well, I have every faith in science, and Mars does seem to be the next frontier. So yes, I imagine we will eventually send a space mission there. But I can't see people living there. Recording eleven A. Speaker A. I live in a cottage. It's a single-story building, so the rooms are all on the same level. It's about a hundred years old, and it's a very traditional design, so there's no concrete or steel to be found. Just about all the buildings in this area were built from timber and stone from the local quarry. It's got a lot of character. What I like best about it are the ceilings. 
They're quite ornate, as they have lots of pretty details on them. Although some people think it's small, I prefer to think of it as cosy. Speaker B. My flat is in a new high-rise building in the city centre. The design is ultra modern, so there's a lot of glass and concrete and steel, and not a lot of wood to be seen. Everything is controlled through a state-of-the-art computer system. It's a very functional apartment, and there's a space to suit every purpose. But I do find the bedrooms a bit cramped. My favourite spot is the balcony. My building towers over everything else, so I can see for miles. Speaker C. I live in a two-story house. It's a very conventional brick building, and it's typical of the area where I live. I love the downstairs rooms as they're very spacious. I spend a lot of time in the living room because it's so light and airy. But my favourite feature is definitely the staircase. It curves around at the bottom and just seems to invite you to climb it. Recording eleven B. Design. Please. Device. Devise. Residence. Housing. Fasten. Destruction. Use. Use. Recording twelve A. I can't decide between the smartphone and the Optima. Which one do you think is better? Well, I prefer the smartphone because it's so compact. I find the Optima a bit bulky. Although I have to say that the size of the smartphone does make it tricky to operate, whereas the Optima is very user friendly. Why do you think that is? Well, the smartphone has a standard telephone keypad, and I find them really awkward to use when I'm sending messages. The Optima opens up to reveal a full keyboard inside. You can also scroll up and down by touching the screen. I like the way the smartphone automatically displays a calendar when you open it up, though. That's a really useful function. Can they both connect to the internet? Yes, they're both equipped with the latest technology. But I find the Optima downloads information a lot faster, and it also has a bigger memory, so it can store more data. Recording twelve B, speaker A. I wash my hair every morning, so the gadget I use most is my, you know, the thing you use to dry your hair. Speaker B. I mainly use my computer as a, you know, to do processing of the things I need to write. Speaker C. One gadget I really want to buy is a machine to blend up food, so I can make my own healthy drinks. Speaker D. I'm not very good at adding up big numbers, so I can't imagine what it was like before they had, you know, those machines that can do it for you. Speaker E. My mother still washes the dishes by hand, and it takes her a long time. I'd like to get a machine that can do the job for her. Recording thirteen A. Just look at this. They're putting one of those cheap restaurant chains in where that nice tea shop used to be. They're owned by some multinational company. At this rate, our culture will disappear altogether, and we'll all end up eating the same bland food. Well, a lot of people are worried about globalization and the impact it could have on the local people, but actually, I'm beginning to think it works the other way around. You can't be serious. Yes, I'm reading a book about it actually, and the author makes some very valid points. He probably works for one of the big multinationals himself. Actually, no, I'm pretty sure he's a journalist. So, what does he say then? Well. He points out that there are far more ethnic restaurants in England than people realise. For example, there are seven Indian restaurants for every one McDonald's in the UK. Really, I didn't realise that. 
Yes, and globally, pizzas are actually more popular than burgers. I think globalization could mean that we end up living a more interesting and multicultural life. Yes, but you've got to admit that worldwide the soft drinks market is totally dominated by just one or two big companies. Well, according to this author, there's a new energy drink taking over the market, and it's a joint venture between Thailand and Austria. Without globalization, international companies just wouldn't merge like that. Well, I think that globalization just pushes popular culture to the masses and spreads even further. When people go travelling to far-flung places, they want to see something exotic, not the same icons they see all around them at home. Yes, but I doubt local people feel they are losing their national identity just because a fast food outlet has opened up. And anyway, the nice thing about it is that in many places, these chains have to change the food they sell to suit the local culture. So there is a lot of give and take going on, and you still get cultural diversity to some extent. I suppose so. I suppose so. I guess no one big multinational has a monopoly over the fashion market either, does it? That's right. The big fashion labels are spread over a lot of different countries. Recording thirteen B. Global. Globalization. Implication. Isolation. Culture. Domestic. International. Local. Skeptical. Modernization. National. Multicultural. Projection. Recording fourteen A. Hi, Jean. You look worried. Is everything okay? Hi, Mary. Actually, I'm facing a few problems at work, and I'm not really sure how to deal with them. What sort of problems? Well, we've just got a new boss, and he's expecting us to start work at eight o'clock in the morning. Of course, that's causing problems for me at home because it means my husband has to take the children to school every morning, which is making him late for work. Oh dear, I know how you feel. I had to deal with a similar problem last year.、Oh, how did you tackle it? Well, I didn't at first, and that created an even worse situation. The traffic is so bad nowadays that I was leaving the house at six thirty every morning to get there in time. Eventually, I realised I would have to address the problem sooner or later, so I raised the issue with my boss. Did you manage to resolve it? Yes, he was terrific. He said he hadn't realised that the early start would present a problem, and he agreed to let me start half an hour later.、Oh, that's great. I'm sure my boss has no idea how much trouble he's caused. Perhaps I should deal with it the same way. Well, they say that identifying the problem is the hardest part; tackling it should be the easy part. <laughs> you haven't met my new boss. Oh. <laughs> Recording fourteen B. Accepted. Crowded. Developed. Excluded. Included. Isolated. Overpriced. Overworked. Resolved. Stressed. Solved. Recording fifteen A, statement one, speaker A. I think it could be beneficial to educate the public this way. Anything we do to raise awareness of these issues is very worthwhile. The more educated people are, the more advantageous it is for the environment. Speaker B. I honestly think it would be pointless. People just don't read leaflets, so handing them out would be futile. Not only would it be a fruitless exercise, but it would also create more litter. 
Statement 2. Speaker A. I think this is an unattainable goal. I think it would prove impracticable even to think about trying to achieve this. Our environmental problems are so great now that it's unfeasible to imagine that we could solve all our pollution problems so quickly. Speaker B. Look, I think everyone in my country is so aware of the impact we're having on the environment that I think it is conceivable that we'll have solved the problem soon. It's quite feasible that we'll all be driving electric cars. They're a viable alternative to petrol driven cars, so getting rid of pollution is definitely achievable. Statement 3. Speaker A. I think it's improbable that everyone will abandon the chemicals we're using now. So many people have been using them for years, and it's questionable whether they will be able to convince everyone. Stop. Yeah, I'd say this one is very doubtful. Speaker B. There are a lot of great cleaning products now that are eco friendly. And I think governments are liable to start putting pressure on manufacturers to produce more products like these. I think it's quite probable that within 10 years everyone will have made the switch. Recording 15B 1. I refuse to go. 2. Disposing of refuse is a growing problem. 3. There is a conflict here. 4. The two reports conflict each other. 5. We all need to be present at the meeting. 6. This issue presents an enormous problem. 7. We are making a lot of progress. 8. We need to progress at a faster rate. 9. There has been an increase in carbon emissions. 10. Temperatures are expected to increase. Recording 16. Let's find out just how environmentally aware you are. Question 1. How many trees do you think it would take to offset the CO2 emissions from a long distance flight? Well, it's estimated that for each mile or 1.6 kilometres that a jet flies, half a kilo of CO2 is added to the atmosphere. So a round trip of 10,000 miles would emit about one and a half tonnes of CO2 per passenger. The amount of CO2 a tree can absorb depends on factors such as its type, location, and age. The company Future Forests says that on average it would take two trees 99 years to counter the effect of this trip. So the answer here is C. Question 2 What is the most environmentally friendly way to wash your clothes? Well, the solvents used by most dry cleaners are damaging to the environment. In a washing machine, the vast majority of the energy, about 90% of it, goes into heating up the water, not running through the cycle. Washing clothes in hot water, even by hand, uses a lot of energy to heat the water. Keeping washing temperatures low and always washing a full load is the best policy. So the correct answer is C. Question 3. Do you need to always turn off your electric lights to save energy? It is a common myth that flicking the lights on and off uses more energy than leaving them on. In fact, an ordinary bulb only has to be turned off for three seconds to outweigh the cost of turning it back on. For energy efficient and other fluorescent bulbs, this rises to five minutes. Energy efficient light bulbs use 75% less energy than ordinary ones, so if you have those but leave them on as you tidy, 
you'll probably still use less energy than if you switch your standard bulbs on and off. So the correct answer is B. Question 4. What is the most energy efficient way of cooking a baked potato? A microwave uses just a third of the electricity required to operate an electric oven. And, of course, the potato will take much less time to cook. So the correct answer is B. Question 5. What is the best way to help reduce your CO2 emissions throughout the year? Well, it's estimated that one person taking the train for a year, rather than driving a car, would reduce their CO2 emission total by 2.9 tonnes. Hanging out your washing rather than using a tumble dryer would cut CO2 by 0.9 tonnes and working from home one day a week would cut 0.88 tonnes. So the correct answer is A. Recording 17A. Speaker 1. I'm a student, so I only work part-time. I managed to get a job as a shelf stacker in the local supermarket. It's unskilled work and very monotonous, but the pay is quite good. Every week when I get my wages, I put them straight into the bank. I'm saving up for a new computer. I've nearly got enough, which is just as well because my prospects aren't good. I think they're going to make me redundant next month. Speaker 2 my occupation is receptionist at a five-star hotel. I got the job while I was studying. We had to complete part of our course in the workplace, and this is where I was placed. It's a very demanding job, and I have to do shift work, which I find exhausting. The perks are great, though. I get to stay in luxurious hotels around the world for next to nothing, and I get on really well with all the other staff. My father worked in this industry all his life. He retired the same year that I started. Speaker 3 I work as a labourer on a construction site. It's manual work, so it's very physical, which keeps me nice and fit. My wages aren't great, but I often get to do a lot of overtime, so I can earn more money that way. Speaker 4 I've always wanted a career in marketing, so I studied as a graphic designer, and when I graduated, I got a job with a marketing company. I had to compete against some very good candidates to get the job, so I was really pleased. I've recently been promoted, and and now I'm in charge of several advertising campaigns. I find the job really rewarding, and that's not just because of the great salary. I get to use the skills I learnt at college. I also get on very well with my colleagues. Job satisfaction is really important to me. Recording 17B Bird Earn First Nurse Perk Purse Work Park Clark Market Target Ball Floor Law Poor Walk Force. Recording 18. In spite of the large number of prisons we have, crime figures have risen again this year, with the number of drug-related crimes in particular increasing. Many law-abiding citizens believe that our existing laws are just not tough enough and do not act as enough of a deterrent against crime. In recent years, there has been a move to abolish laws which were deemed to be too harsh or strict, or strict and to reduce the punishment for non-violent crimes, such as those against property. On the other hand, in some countries, the police can enforce laws against crossing the street at the wrong place by imposing a fine. 
laws like this are passed simply to keep us safe, and some see them as an intrusion on our privacy. Focusing on petty crimes in this way can also cause people who generally obey the law to resent the police rather than respect them for what they do. They would rather their time was spent solving more serious crimes. It's difficult to believe that reducing punishments will help to combat crime. It goes without saying that laws against serious crimes should be strictly enforced. However, we also need to focus more attention on crime prevention and educating young people to abide by the law. They need to know that no one is above the law, and there are serious consequences if they're involved in criminal activities in any way. Some people believe that non-violent crimes, or so-called victimless crimes such as fraud, should be punished less. However, there is always a victim somewhere, even if that victim is a company and its owners. And victims often feel the effects of a crime for many years, whether the attack is planned or random. Perhaps it's time to start introducing new laws rather than abolishing them. Recording 19A. Good morning. My name is Dan Taylor, and I'm professor of sociology here at Manly University. Our modern society often prides itself on its free press, and with access to the internet and cable television, the news is broadcast 24 hours a day. However, we have just completed a study which reveals that the general public is increasingly ill-informed today. For this project, we compiled a list of what we considered to be the most significant current affairs stories, and then we assessed how these stories were reported by newspapers and radio and television networks. Alarmingly, we found that as many as 25 significant news stories were either under-reported or omitted from the news altogether. It would seem that the media today seeks to entertain rather than inform the public. I define censorship as anything which interferes with the free flow of information in our society, and this would seem to be what tabloid journalism is doing. They are effectively censoring important news stories on the basis that they may not be interesting or entertaining enough. One example is the widening gap between the rich and the poor. This is a major problem in big cities today, and yet you are unlikely to find a reference to it in any news headlines. Instead, you're more likely to find stories about the latest celebrity, with important news content relegated to the back pages. Recording 19B. Would you like to be famous? I think a lot of people want to be famous nowadays, and that's why reality TV is so popular. But I wouldn't like to be famous at all. Being famous nowadays simply means that you're in the tabloids a lot, and you're followed by the paparazzi everywhere you go. I'd find that very intrusive. Famous people have no privacy at all in any part of their life. Their life also seems to be very superficial because they spend all of their time going to parties and trying to look glamorous. It all seems very artificial to me. They just don't seem to be part of the real world at all.、Mm. Do you think famous people have a positive or a negative influence on young people? I think they should have a positive influence on young people, but many of them don't. Some personalities are good role models and use their celebrity status to encourage people to think about important issues, but we often see photos of famous people behaving badly. Nowadays, we have access to the news 24 hours a day. What effect does this have? I think it can affect us in both positive and negative ways. On the one hand, it's very convenient to be able to catch up with what's happening in the world at any time of the day or night, no matter where you are. But on the other hand, this kind of news can give you a distorted view of what's happening, because even minor news stories are given more importance than they perhaps should have. Recording 19C. Artificial. 
attention, biased, censor, exposed, exposure, intrusive, intrusion, invasion, invasive. Publication. Superficial. Recording 20A. For those of you who are interested in aesthetics, why not consider a visit to Bethania Island this year? The island will host three arts festivals, each one showcasing different areas of the art world. First, there is Living Writers Week. Throughout the week, there will be talks by local and international writers, and a chance to dine with them at the various literary lunches. You'll also be able to pick up old and new editions at the very large book fair. The little ones haven't been forgotten, and so there are plenty of children's activities planned as well. As is the case each year, there will be a theme for the festival, and this year it is island life. Later in the year, there will be a celebration of the visual arts. There are some very famous and plished painters in residence on the island, and their work will be featured in a wonderful exhibition. Works by Alex Green, whose paintings depict the beautiful scenery this island is famous for, will be a prominent feature. Visitors to the festival will get the chance to discuss the creative process with the artists, and there will also be opportunities to try out your own artistic skills at the workshops being held at various galleries on the island. To, to do all, all off, there will be a display of crafts created by emerging artists. You'll be amazed at the intricate wooden carving introduced by local craftsmen. And finally. If you love music, then you shouldn't miss the festival and voices. You will be able to hear performers from around the world. You'll be. What makes this even more interesting is that some of this year's performances are going to be interactive, so members of the audience will be invited to participate as well. One of the stages will be devoted to showcasing musical theatre, and the good news is that there will be plenty of free concerts for everyone to enjoy. Recording twenty B. My taste in music is quite eclectic, and there isn't really one style of music that I like. I listen to everything from popular music to classical. Music plays a very important role in my life, and I listen to it almost constantly. I find that it helps to set or to change a mood. So I tend to choose my music according to who I'm with or what I'm doing. For example, if I'm driving long distances in my car, I prefer to play something stimulating to help keep me awake. But if I'm having a dinner party with friends, then I play something more relaxing. I think that music helps to inspire me when I'm working, although my colleagues find it distracting. So I tend to listen with headphones on. In that way, I can escape into my own little world. When I was younger, I would definitely have said that I preferred live music. The atmosphere in a live concert can be electric. Nowadays, though, a lot of popular groups only perform at very large venues in front of audiences of twenty thousand or more, and I don't really like that. I prefer the intimacy of listening to recorded music, and the sound quality is better as well. Music really enriches our lives. It can turn a boring, monotonous period of time into a magical experience. So I think it's essential to have music, and in fact, all of the arts in your life. Recording twenty C. Atmosphere. Classical. Edition. Festival. Fundamental. Imagination. Literary, monotonous, musical, performance, popular, visual. Recording twenty one. Put these in 
some ball choose word about guest what attack hard Recording 22A. 1. Analysis. Analyze. Analytical. 2. Benefit. Benefit. Beneficial. 3. Consistency. Consist. Consistent. 4. Creation. Creator. Creativity. Create. Creative. 5. Definition. Define. Definable. Definitive. Definite. 6. Environment. Environmentalist. Environmental. 7. Occurrence. Occur. 8. Period. Periodical. Periodic. 9. Significance. Signify. Significant. 10. Theory. Theorize. Theoretical. Recording 22B. A. Leading environmentalists are concerned about the effects our modern lifestyle is having on global warming. B. Scientists have shown that including fish in our diet may be beneficial in reducing heart disease. C. Satellites have recently sent back important new data from Mars, although it is not yet clear what significance the findings have for future space exploration. D. Young children are often very creative, although many give up art when they begin high school. E. Your essay is good, but you need to define the causes of pollution more clearly. F. I prefer teachers who don't put too much emphasis on learning and studying the theory of chemistry. I'm much more interested in the practical side of things. G. The student council consists of ten undergraduates and four postgraduate students. H. After you've planted your seeds, you can't simply leave them to grow. They do need to be checked periodically for weeds and pests. I. We analysed the test results to see whether there really is a link between video games and increased violence. J. J. The torrential storm last night seems to be part of a pattern. A similar storm occurred two years ago, following a severe drought.